Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I'd like to start off this monologue on actual God by uh, reciting a poem written by Christopher Fry in 1951. This poem is called A Sleep of Prisoners. I imagine many of you have heard it before. The human heart can go to the lengths of God. Dark and cold we may be. But this is no winter now. The frozen misery of centuries breaks, cracks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flows, the thaw, the flood, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to face us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul we ever took. Affairs are now soul size. The enterprise is exploration into God. Where are you making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake. But will you wake for pity's sake? Actual God is a term that was introduced to me by my friend, my former college roommate from my University of Wisconsin days going back to 1968-69, James P. Driscoll. Notice that Jung, Carl Jung used the term actual God as distinct from the Godhead figures of civilization, distinct from the Christian God, the Jewish God, the Islamic God, the Buddhist, <laughs> I don't want to call it a, a deity, <laughs> the Buddhist nothingness, <laughs> or the many Hindu approximations to God. He's suggesting that civilizational gods are very important. They help organize entire civilizations. And in a way, he thinks of the civilization Godhead as sort of like the self of a civilization. And he also refers to Jung, who claimed that the, the Godhead archetype is the archetype of the self. But actual God is different. Actual God According to Driscoll, and it makes sense, there's a certain logic to it, actual God would have to be the same on the most distant galaxy as here on Earth. And if you think of <laughs> the potential trillions of planets that might have sentient beings in this universe, there, there might be trillions of civilizational gods each one in, in its own way, an approximation of actual God. But is actual God ever knowable? And I have to say, there might be some reasons to think so. Uh, for example, I notice in Christopher Isherwood's translation of the Yoga Sutras, and uh, Isherwood was, of course, a, a, a great writer and a friend of Aldous Huxley and a follower of Sri Ramakrishna, who um, wrote a book, a translation of the Yoga Sutras, and he titled it, How to Know God. The implication is very clear that by practicing yoga, by quieting one's mind so that the calmness of the mind is like the still surface of a lake, able to reflect perfectly the environment around it, that through quieting the mind, one can know actual God. The Buddhists, I think, have, have a different view. They <laughs> suggest that ultimately actual God is pure nothingness. Uh, now what that nothingness is in, in Buddhist terms, nirvana. <laughs> 
<laughs> that is also a great mystery to be probed. And I'll set that aside for now. Let me mention another book that claims you can know God. Written by my friends, Russell Targ, along with Jane Catra, a spiritual healer. Russell's been a guest on the New Thinking Aloud channel many times, and I hope eventually we'll get Jane here as well. But their point is, is a bit different than Christopher Isherwood's notion. They claim that you don't have to believe in God to know God. That if you open up your heart, if you experience this sense of universal love. I think their their idea is that God created the universe out of an effulgence of love, that God loves us, something uh, like the anthropic principle in uh, physics, the idea that the universe was created to support sentient life. It could have been very different. Now, I know that's a controversial idea, but in any case, what Russell is saying is, you want to know God? Let yourself experience love. Let yourself go so deep that you experience universal love. It's not that hard to do, he seems to imply. I I think for some people, it's much harder than for other people, but... What he's saying in any case is you might call it a form of bhakti yoga, but we know God through love. Now, I'm not agreeing necessarily with either of those viewpoints. I'm just suggesting that there are people out there, people I respect, who maintain that one can know God. Uh, now, many of you who have been listening to the new Thinking Aloud channel know I've done many interviews with Bernardo Kastrup, a wonderful fi- philosopher who espouses ontological idealism, the idea, basically, that the entire universe is mental, that the universe is, itself is a psychological universe. It's based on experience that, uh, in effect, I think Bernardo would say that the consciousness experienced, the local individual consciousness experienced by all sentient beings exists embedded in a larger consciousness. That everything that is ever experienced, being experienced, is psychological. You don't need to go any further. You don't have to postulate an extra ontological category like matter. Again, a very controversial position, but there is a lot of logic behind it. And I bring it up as a, uh, a vector, a a way of thinking about things that is quite consistent with the whole project of parapsychology. It's probably the reason, in fact, that parapsychology is so controversial. You know, when J.B. Ryan, the father of modern parapsychology, uh, started doing research in the 1930s at Duke University, and he left Duke University in the mid-1960s and set up an independent organization in Durham, North Carolina called the Foundation for Research on the Nature of Man. And the point behind that name, sexist as it is, is, is that the nature of man, what he was trying to say is that our nature is fundamentally spiritual. It's not fundamentally material. And in a way, what Ryan seemed to be proposing, although he didn't want to make it a proposition, I think it was just sort of a a direction he was angling at. And I'm pretty sure that Ryan believed that the data, the empirical data of parapsychology was pointing in exactly that direction. And, uh, of course, Ryan used terms like extrasensory perception, which was very strange because we've never identified an organ of perception or a channel of perception. All one can say is that if the universe is mental, then things that seem paradoxical, like the hard problem of consciousness or the data of parapsychology, are no longer so problematic. In a mental universe, these things 
these paradoxes, these, these interminable problems go away completely. They are only problems for materialism. So if we start from the perspective of a non-material mental universe, and we include the data of parapsychology, and we accept the notion that actual God is distinct from the Godhead images of each and every civilization, we have, I think, what might be viewed as the beginnings, just the very beginnings, and certainly nowhere near the final product, but the beginnings of what I'll call a new theology, a theology that could be based on empirical data, a theology that could be well-grounded in logic, a theology that will probably in many ways resemble uh, the ancient uh, teachings of Vedanta, although that remains to be seen. And here are some of my own speculations about that theology. Let's assume for the moment that there is one consciousness that seems to be uh, implicit in Bernardo Castrop's very logical ontology. If we assume that there is one consciousness, and that consciousness is the silent observer inside of each and every sentient being throughout the universe, throughout all possible universes, throughout the multiverse, then the next question that arises, is this consciousness simultaneously aware of the experiences of each and every individual sentient being embedded within it. If that were the case, how awesome would that be? That would be very awesome, I think, to imagine a God capable of simultaneously experiencing with great detail and precision the experiences of trillions trillions of sentient beings. I was pondering this, and, and it just seems so far removed from human consciousness, so vast, so different, so inaccessible. But then it occurred to me, um, I guess maybe I was thinking along the lines of the hermetic principle of as above, so below. I, I began thinking about, well, what am I? Who am I? I am a being composed of trillions of individual cells. What would it be like for me to be simultaneously conscious of the activity of each and every one of those cells? Again, the thought was completely overwhelming. I mean, so far removed from my little bitty consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be aware of one or two things at a time and expressing them to myself in the, either the English language or familiar icons uh, that my mind can manipulate. But then I began to think, well, I wonder if it's possible, could I choose to be conscious of just a single cell? And as I had that thought, I realize that, well, in biofeedback, we know that people can learn how to control the activity of a single neuron. So, yes, it is possible to gain consciousness of an individual cell through biofeedback, through, uh, you know, I recently interviewed Etzel Cardenia, who pointed out the enormous progress that's been made in altered states of consciousness and how much all kinds of human capacities are uh, capable of being enhanced. And certainly hypnosis is, is the outstanding example of what can be done. So if I could become conscious of an individual cell, maybe I could become conscious of two or three or four. That might be a step toward understanding this idea of God simultaneously conscious of trillions of individual sentient beings. Now, maybe God doesn't operate any 
differently than the human being. In other words, maybe God is no more conscious of me than I'm conscious of, of one of the trillions of cells in my body. That might be. In fact, Bernardo Castrop suggests that this idea of, of this universal consciousness, as powerful as it is, might still be very instinctive, very, in a sense, primitive, not necessarily highly evolved. The idea of uh, human rational thought may be a, a, a kind of higher stage of evolution in some ways than the instinctive mind of the universal consciousness. There's no reason reason necessarily to equate a universal consciousness that is sort of the foundation of all sentient beings with God. It might be completely different. And uh, many metaphysical theorists view it that way. But what I'm suggesting is that the, a new theology can list these unanswered questions and can begin to think about ways in which they might be approachable either through rigorous logic or through empirical investigation. The whole field of parapsychology, well, why isn't it viewed as a branch of psychology? Why are psychologists so intimidated, so afraid, so fearful of parapsychology, so eager to suppress it, even after well over a hundred years of data? And it may well be because the implications of parapsychology are not just psychological, they are theological. It's a thought. It suggests that we might move into a, a new era in which theology is not divorced from mainstream culture. If mainstream culture is materialistic, theology has become kind of a, a side activity relegated to, you know, each religion has their own unique theology, completely disconnected from science. It's possible that a new culture, a new ethos would be one in which our scientific understanding and our theological understanding would be unified. And parapsychology will have an important role to play if that were to happen. My best guess is that, yes, it is happening. It will happen. And we are on the cusp right now of a new era in which that will be the case. But to be honest, <laughs> I'll go along with Peter Kingsley, who suggested it could take 600 years. It could take 600 years, but that process is probably beginning right now. And for people who are awake and alert, and I suspect a number of viewers of this channel are, it's something to start thinking about. Uh, I want to emphasize, I don't have final answers, but I can begin to see the questions that need to be asked. I can begin to see the outlines of what might be coming together. And that is a new understanding of actual God, or as Christopher Fry wrote in 1951, the enterprise is exploration into God. Now, I might also add, I've done a number of programs on the idea of state-specific science, and I've uh, conducted an interview uh, not so long ago with William Van Gordon, an advanced Buddhist meditator who has been doing studies with other advanced Buddhist meditators, people who have at least 10 years of meditative practice behind them, who are able to, in meditation, experience, for example, the Bardo Plains, or enter into a, a state uh, that is statistically comparable to a near-death experience and begin to uh, give us observations, 
that can be compared, just like people visiting a new continent and coming back with their observations of what they have observed. And after many, many explorers come back and report their experiences of this new continent, we can begin to create maps. We can begin to even create uh, anthropological studies of uh, what what the uh, people are like (laughs) in these new continents. I can foresee that that will be happening, that, uh, you know, we've explored all the continents on this earth, but what we have yet to explore in any kind of a systematic fashion, although I have to say perhaps the Buddhists are quite advanced in this area, is what they call the Bardo Plains. And that would be a step in exploration into God the studies of reincarnation going on right now at the University of Virginia, another step in the exploration of God. The burgeoning field of transpersonal psychology, the burgeoning field of near-death studies, the burgeoning field of meditation research, these are all efforts that are Starting, they're in the very early stages, by which I mean maybe 30, 40, 50 years old, (laughs) into exploration into actual God. One other thought I had. Um, Jane Roberts, the channeler, uh, wrote a novel, a fascinating novel. Uh, She channeled all of these Seth books. Uh, Undoubtedly, uh, most readers are familiar with them. They were bestsellers. But one that really stuck in my mind is is a novel called The Education of Oversoul 7. And it describes in very graphic terms the idea of a of a higher soul, a soul responsible for seven other personalities existing simultaneously, but in different times in different eras, in different cultures. Now, of course, seven is a far, far cry from trillions, but I think Jane Roberts' novel actually is is a way of approaching what would it be like to be simultaneously aware of the experience of trillions of sentient beings. You have to start somewhere, and maybe seven isn't a bad number to to think about. Perhaps that novel, in, in its own way, is a step in the direction of getting humans to think about these larger possibilities of consciousness, possibilities so vastly beyond <laughs> what my friend Bruce Damer likes to think of us as monkeys. <laughs> So vastly beyond monkey consciousness. You know, my mentor, Arthur Young, once suggested that we modern humans stand in relationship to our own potential as human beings as clams stand in relationship to the animal kingdom. We are about as evolved humans as we can be, as clams are evolved as animals. So, potentially, we have a very, very long way to go. And it strikes me that potentially that ability to simultaneously get inside of the minds of several other people, many other people, is a step toward the the actual God consciousness. Uh, Another reason I think that actually, you could say, comes from my friend Jim Driscoll, who initiated uh, this train of thought in the first place. Jim is a Shakespearean scholar. He claims, and I think probably most scholars and and other fields would agree, that Shakespeare stands as at the pinnacle of the literary world, not just in the English language, but in the literary world of all languages. Now, people can argue about that, but I think a good case could be made for the notion that Shakespeare is the greatest writer who ever lived. Well, what what about that? So what? Shakespeare, in his writing, shows the ability to get inside the mind of people from every walk of life, from every caste and culture, 
people who are peasants, people who are royalty, people who are soldiers, people who are merchants, men, women, youths, old people. Somehow he showed that that's possible and, and able to do it and articulate it beautifully. So that might be yet another example. Driscoll tends to think of Shakespeare as, as part of our religious canon. He thinks the whole Western intellectual tradition, the great writers of not just the West, I think you could say every culture, represent in their own way revelation. And if we're to look at the great writers, playwrights, and novelists as part of that revelation, surely the idea of being able to understand what it's like to be many other people and many other sentient beings, even not just humans, that may be the direction of actual God. I'll leave you with those thoughts. And thank you once again for being with me. Thank you.